Good morning. My name is Kayla, and I'm one of the pastors here at Northgate, where we envision transforming our homes, communities, and world by pursuing God, building community, and unleashing compassion. I'm so glad that we get to worship and learn together this morning. We are right in the middle of our Christmas series called Wreck the Halls. In this series, we're saying, okay, when I see the perfect, precious Christmas story presented, and then I look at my own not-so-perfect and precious life, I want to know how this all adds up. We're looking at stories from Jesus' life and seeing that Jesus, his whole life, was about taking our assumptions about God and life and flipping them upside down. We see that Jesus, he actually came to wreck religion, society, and if you let him, he'll even wreck your life. And that might be just exactly what you need. Last week, Pastor Larry started us out and said, Jesus came to wreck religion and he did it with grace. Religion says, first you love God, and then the result of you doing that is that he gives you joy. But God says, no, 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 it's the other way around. I love you, and you bring me joy because you're my child. And that's called grace, and that's for everyone. And that totally wrecks the way religion is supposed to work. Today, I want to talk to you about how Jesus came 2,000 years ago to wreck society and how he still wants to wreck society today. Maybe that doesn't seem so bad to you right now. I mean, I'm not super sure that our society is a picture of perfection right now, right? So let's start with this so we can all start from the same place. When we say society, we're talking about the overall invisible system that people live in together. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as an aggregate of people living together in a more or less orderly community. See, a society requires rules, both written and unwritten, to create the more or less orderly community. If you want to make it, you, if you want to survive as part of society, you got to play the game a little bit to live in community. In ancient times, in Bible times, a lot of people, specifically the Jewish people, felt like their society wasn't really set up for them. Particularly in the time when Jesus came on the scene, during that very first Christmas, the Romans were in charge and they were not so benevolent rulers. The Jewish people of Jesus' day wanted to be free from the domination of the Roman Empire that had ruled them for years. Revolt was constantly brewing, mostly underground, for more than a hundred years. And that's the real backdrop for Christmas. Add to that the Old Testament stories and promises that all the little boys and girls grew up learning and hearing in the synagogue and from their parents, even from the story of Adam and Eve, when the serpent talked them into eating the apple and they all got tossed out of Eden. The promise was that a deliverer would be born to the woman who would be victorious over the serpent. In fact, some scholars think that when Eve had her first son, she thought he was the one who would overcome. Of course, that was a tragic mistake. But God's people were already looking for the promised deliverer. Then came the prophets. Micah, who said, But out of you, Bethlehem, will come a ruler over Israel for me. And then Isaiah, who gave us maybe the most well-known Christmas prophecy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. See, they had been promised, and they were waiting for this Messiah to come and save them. And because of the oppression that they'd been living under for hundreds of years, they were really hoping, and maybe even assuming, that he would be a conquering king, that, that he would overthrow the Roman Empire, that they were going to finally be set free to create a whole new society. But in the meantime, the Jewish people were really divided about how to respond to their current situation with their Roman oppressors. The Zealots, an ultra-nationalistic group, thought revolution was going to be God's solution, and they were so ready to be a part of it. The Essens withdrew, waiting anxiously for the Messiah to come and lead a violent overthrow of the Romans and their Jewish supporters. The Sadducees apparently practiced a form of cooperation, 
probably since it was the Romans who kept them in power and in position over the temple and therefore over the Jewish people. The Herodians seemed to be quite satisfied with the Roman government and the Pharisees totally removed themselves from politics because of Rome's pagan behavior and they viewed any oppression as God's hand punishing his people. This nation was in turmoil. Each fragment was longing for the freedom that a Messiah would bring. In fact, many so-called messiahs did come, each preaching his own brand of salvation. And it was in the middle of all this confusion, hatred, division, and chaos that the real messiah came. Everything was lining up just like the prophets said it would. Bethlehem, a baby born of a virgin, Emmanuel. Jesus was born and he lived a perfect life. He gained followers, he did miracles, he preached a different way, and then he died. Wait, what? That, that's not what any of them had pictured. Jesus wrecked their expectations. He wrecked them so bad that even after the apex of history, the climax of all time, when Jesus died and rose from the dead and appeared to tons of people, and then he gets taken up to heaven in a cloud, after all that, the first century Christians started to wonder if the cross actually did anything at all. I mean, Rome was still in power. Their oppressors had not been overthrown. They were still suffering. To some, it started to seem like maybe there wasn't any significance to that whole thing after all. I mean, it didn't accomplish what they thought it would. They wanted Jesus to wreck Roman society. But what they saw in their circumstances, in their day-to-day -day life, it, it certainly didn't seem to reflect any kind of revolution. Where was this kingdom Jesus promised? Where was the peace? Does this sound familiar? Our own society seems pretty messed up right now. We've never been more divided as a nation and as a church as Christians. It begs the question, where is this kingdom Jesus came to establish? Why isn't the government on his shoulders right now? We are splintering ourselves into the same groups and factions, all hoping and begging to be set free. We reach for the same weapons the Jewish people did. You see, we think revolution and inflicting pain on the enemy is going to be the solution. When we hurt, we want the person who hurt us to hurt as well. When we suffer, they should get a taste of their own medicine. We rebel and withdraw, spewing hate for the other side and anyone who supports them. Some of us just try and go with the flow, doing whatever needs to be done to keep our status and power, no matter who else it hurts. And some of us, some of us just remove ourselves from the conversation completely, staying above the fray, we say, refusing to use our voices for good or against injustice, just assuming that God must be punishing us for the bad we've done. But it didn't work for the first Christians, and it won't work for us either. None of these weapons actually help us do the things that Jesus set out to accomplish. Instead, they keep us trapped in the very oppression Jesus came to free us from. We all see the messed up world and we know it's not right. We see injustice. We see people who oppress those who don't have as much power. We see people being taken advantage of. We want our broken, messed up society to change. We want a revolution. We want things the way they should be. We are ready for a Messiah to come and whip this thing into shape. That's what the Jewish, Jewish people wanted and that's what we want too. But Jesus gave them and us a new way to influence society. That's what I want, don't you? I, I think we all want the ability to have influence in the world around us. But if we wanna change the way that things are, we have to stop doing what everybody else is doing. When Jesus came, when the Messiah came, the reason he didn't just overthrow the powers that be like the people expected, and let me be clear, he could have. With one flick of his wrist, he could have done it. But he knew it wouldn't have wrecked enough. You know, we bought a house once that was in foreclosure and it was a wreck. They must have had feral cats living in that house because when you walked in, the smell hit you in the face like a brick, a very stinky brick. 
we pulled out the carpet in every room. And as we were planning to put more down, the contractor told us we had more work to do. He, he said that if we just put brand new carpet over the old subfloor, the very first time someone spilled a drink or there was moisture in the air, that smell would just seep right back up and we would be in the same mess. We had to do something different. We couldn't just do the same thing, only newer, and hope that everything would change. Jesus knew that if he were to come as a conquering king and overthrow the Roman government, the people would still be sitting on the same foundation they were before and it stunk. So instead, he used completely different tactics and it did change society. The revolution that Jesus started would change the world. The historian H.G. Wells said, I'm not a believer, but I must confess as a historian that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all history. And here's just a few ways Jesus wrecked society. He changed the world for women. Throughout ancient history, we see endless examples of women treated inhumanely, but Jesus treated women with dignity and respect that stood in stark contrast to society. Jesus' friends and ministry partners were women. In the Roman world, women were worth less than men, but in Jesus' eyes, they were equally valuable, having been made in the image of God. And the trajectory since then has only gone up. Jesus' pure, sacrificial love for women has undoubtedly made our planet a better place to live. Jesus changed the world when it comes to human rights. Today in America, we think that basic human rights are common sense, but that hasn't always been the case. The idea that all humans should be treated with dignity was extremely rare before Jesus stepped onto the scene. Jesus said in Matthew 5:44, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. Jesus said to love your neighbor and your enemies, and that just about covers everybody. Abolition, the fight against racism and segregation, those movements began with people that followed this Jesus, this Messiah. Jesus said, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Jesus' disciple John said, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? In scripture, we see Jesus healing the sick and helping the poor and the outcast. In the early church, they were even charged to care for orphans and widows and the immigrant. And we still see that legacy of caring for those in need today. A recent study has shown that up to 75% of all charitable donations in the U.S. are motivated by faith. Christians send missionaries and volunteers all over the world to minister to people's needs, both physical and spiritual. And how about education? See Jesus' words in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's ironic that society tries to make Christians look ignorant and uneducated when Christians have done more to inspire education in the modern world than any other group. St. Patrick's ministry is the reason Ireland became literate. Nearly all of the first universities in England and America were started by Christians. This faith that Jesus taught was not a blind leap in the dark or a way to empty your mind. Jesus' words captivate the mind. Even the physicist Paul Davies, a non-believer, can see how the origin of science is rooted in Christian beliefs. He says, all the early scientists, such as Newton, were religious in one way or another. They saw their science as a means of uncovering traces of God's handiwork in the universe. Galileo, Newton, Copernicus, Kepler, Pascal, all these men were inspired by their faith to discover and learn science. But bigger still, and impossible to quantify, is the impact Jesus had on the world through individual people. The ripple effect of parents following Jesus as they raise their children, 
who then become teachers who educate and love the next generation. The man who finds Jesus and breaks the cycle of physical abuse that had been in his family for generations. The teenage girl who finds out there is a God who loves her and has a purpose for her, no matter what social media and culture tries to tell her about herself who then tells her friends, one of which was in the throes of an eating disorder that would have killed her. The stories are endless and ongoing. We can only imagine the impact they've had on society. But as we look at our wrecked society today, when we look at what's going on in our world, it can be tempting to wonder where that peace is that was promised. Here we are. 2,000 years later, finding ourselves wondering, like the first century Christians were wondering, what the significance of all that was. Where's the deliverance? Where is the peace that was promised? Listen, it's a legitimate question. It's interesting to me that in the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, each of them tell the story of Jesus' life on earth. Matthew writes about the Christmas story. Mark writes about the Christmas story. Luke writes about it. But when it comes to John, he was the last one to write down his account. He tells it from a different perspective, and he doesn't even write the Christmas story into his gospel. We actually have to get into Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, the one John wrote at the very end of his life to a group of Christians who were asking that question. Did we pledge our allegiance to the right kingdom? Are you sure that was the promised Messiah? Is victory really coming? Basically, John says there's what we think when we know about the Christmas story because of the historical account we've been told, and then there's a whole other layer that we haven't even talked about yet. And that part changes everything. In Revelation chapter 12, John begins to tell his version of the nativity scene. He starts like this, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains at the agony of giving birth. Listen, I know there's a lot of symbolism here, because beyond the first three chapters of Revelation, the book reads like apocalyptic literature, which just means that there's a lot of symbolism that we need to weed through to understand what it meant to the original readers so that we can apply it to our lives today. In this passage, John's audience would have immediately recognized this as a reference to the nativity. He's referring to Mary, about to give birth to Jesus. They would be reminded of this silent and holy night in history when there was so much promise for God to deliver them. But then he starts describing something new. He says this, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stairs of heaven and cast them into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Hold on. There was a dragon in the barn at the manger? This, this actually kind of reminds me about the time that my son put Batman in the middle of the nativity set we had at home. Friends, there's still more symbolism here, but put simply, we can tell this is a very powerful beast. John is pulling back the veil and letting his readers see what was happening beneath the surface of this supposedly peaceful moment in history. There is a war here. The dragon was getting ready to try and snatch God's perfect plan out of existence before it even had the chance to happen. If we skip ahead the next few verses, we're getting to the good part. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Victory, Satan loses. We we actually get to hear a little bit of the celebration that John describes here. It says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And here's the climax of the entire book of Revelation and the entire purpose of the church, the 
the big C church. This is what John had been pointing and building up to and everything after this and in the book of Revelation points back to it. Verse 11, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So how do we win? By the blood of the lamb and by our witness. Jesus is the one that makes it possible, but we are not passive watchers of the story playing out. We have a significant role to play in the rest of God's story, and it's not cheap. For they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I I can't help but think of Jesus' words to his disciples after Peter told Jesus to stop talking about his death. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. It sounds like we'll have to submit to the very thing we thought would destroy us. Take up the cross, deny yourself. This is the instruction to get the life we always wanted. Back in Revelation, we find out in the next few verses that the story is not actually over. The dragon comes after the woman, and when he can't get to her, verse 17 says, Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Who's he after? Those who keep God's commands and hold on to their witness. So so why is there still so much suffering? Why is there still so much pain in the world? Because the enemy is ticked. He knows his time is short and he's coming after us. Yeah, we live in a fractured society. We live in a world where the enemy is still working and looking to take as many people with him before his time is up. He is trying to turn us against each other and pick us off one by one. But the Christmas story is one that represents a coming victory for God's people. A story of when God came down in human form to live among us. At Christmas, we celebrate the event that set off a chain of events that brings us the long-awaited Messiah. The Christmas tree becomes a beacon for another tree, the one that leads us to Jesus' ultimate victory over sin and death on the cross. Friends, Jesus really did come to wreck society, and he isn't done yet. Let me just state the obvious. 2020 has directed a spotlight and heightened our awareness of the mess we are in as a society. And when I look around, I see a bunch of people hungry for a Messiah, picking up the same weapons that have never worked to begin with. But Jesus showed us a different way. He said, our weapons need to be different than the ones used against us. Our weapons aren't the ones we've been reaching for our whole lives. Our pitchforks, won't pave the path for peace anymore. Jesus turned all of that on its head. So yeah, Jesus wrecked society, but he's also wrecking how we see society. He's challenging us to see people like he sees them. So instead of inflicting more pain and suffering with our words, he tells us to surrender to Christ and to one another through self-sacrifice. Instead of carrying around truth like a pitchfork of pride, we pick up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and we let it speak to and through us. Instead of rebelling and distancing ourselves from anyone who isn't on our side, He calls us to be carriers of grace, showing the world how reconciliation works. Friends, Jesus came to wreck society, and we have a role to play. I don't want to miss it. Do you?